Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well and enjoying the, the conference so far. So before I uh, get started and tell you about the topic of my discussion, I want to pay tribute to uh, the, the person pictured here, Donald John Mackay, who um, was involved in setting up the Gallic College on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. And um, he also contributed to a wide range of uh, uh, schemes in society. Um, I was lucky enough to be granted the uh, second Donald John Mackay Award. So I hope that I can translate some of this research into Gaelic at some point, uh, because although it's about the Celtic languages, the information is not widely available actually in the Celtic languages, but only in uh, English and German, really. So I'll get started now. I'm going to be talking about the origins of the Celtic languages from an archaeological perspective. But I'm drawing upon a, a few different uh, disciplines, archaeology, historical linguistics, uh, genetics, and within those many subdisciplines. So um, I should also say that my definition of the word Celtic is linguistic. There are other definitions, and sometimes people don't define what they mean by the word, and it does get a little bit ambiguous. So I've given you my definition. I'm talking about languages. So what you see here is the standard uh, traditional model of understanding of the Celtic languages. That is that they originated in uh, Central Europe, in Austria, Switzerland, um, during the Iron Age, and that they subsequently spread out. There's also uh, an alternative, um, an alternative theory which has gained quite a bit of popularity and attention over the past ten years or so, uh, which is called the Celtic from the West model which uh, believes that the Celtic languages originated in the far west of Europe, specifically in Britain and Ireland, and uh, possibly in the west of France and the Iberian Peninsula. And these are areas where uh, historically, rather than prehistorically and proto-historically, historically in these areas, we know that the Celtic languages have been spoken. So if I'm going to be speaking about the origins of the Celtic languages, I also need to look into uh, the Indo-European languages because Celtic is a subfamily of the Indo-European language family. It's one branch of the Indo-European language family. So if you've not heard of uh, Indo-European before, um, well, uh, Proto-Indo-European uh, would have been one language in a much more confined area than Indo-European languages are now spoken. So, um, from Ireland and the in, uh, Irish in the in the west to India and Iran and further east in the east, um, a great uh, number of the indigenous languages in uh, that huge land wave that I've just mentioned uh, speaks under European languages. And uh, they've all originated from one uh, language, which we've called Proto-Indo-European, which no longer exists other than in reconstructions. When we find cognate words between various languages that we can determine are not through loan words, uh, they can be attributed to uh, the progenitor language. So that's what I've got here. Proto-Indo-European has evolved into a number of languages, for example, Gaelic, Sanskrit, English, and so on. There's uh, two main models for the origins of the Indo-European languages, and I'll be talking about both of them. Um, there's the Anatolian hypothesis, which holds that uh, Indo-European languages originated in the Anatolian Peninsula, or Turkey, and that the spread of agriculture and farming and the Neolithic way of life, um, which spread out from Anatolia, went hand in hand with the spread of Indo-European languages. 
And the other model is called the Pontic Caspian step model or the step hypothesis. And uh, so the area shown in orange there, mostly Ukraine and uh, south of Russia, um, that in that area uh, between the Pontic, aka Black, and Caspian Seas uh, is where the Indo-European languages originated and that they spread out um, slightly later than uh, the Anatolian hypothesis holds that they spread out. And uh, by the way, on this map, you can also see uh, the green areas show where Indo-European languages are now um, are now spoken, and the grey areas show uh, that where they're not spoken. So, for example, Hungary, uh, the Basque Country, Finland, Estonia, North Africa, and so on. So what you see here is basically a contents page for the rest of my talk. Um, so we've got various in the middle, the middle column, we've got uh, three different hypotheses for Celtic origins from an archaeological perspective. And uh, they go hand in hand with their applicable uh, Indo-European models how Indo-European languages got to Europe so that the Celtic subfamily could diverge. And some of these are applying to the Celtic from the West model, which I mentioned, but uh, the, also the Iron Age model um, in some of its forms uh, doesn't. It holds that the, the Celtic languages originated in Central Europe. So I'll, I'll give you a run through all of these models. And uh, again, this is um, to prepare you for what's ahead. Um, so what you see here is basically pr uh, European prehistory in a nutshell. On the left hand, we have the local population um, over time from a, being a hunter-gatherer population. And on the right hand column, we can see that there's been um, two major migrations into Europe. The first being uh, farmers from the Anatolian Peninsula, and the second being from the Pontic Caspian Steppe. And both of these uh, major migrations are linked with hypotheses that they are the reason why Indo European languages are spoken in Europe. Everything on this, um, on this aid memoir, everything on this picture definitely happened. But the linguistic interpretation, uh, both of the linguistic interpretations, are um, what I'll be discussing. And they are additional and uh, not so um, confirmed as these events in the picture. So starting with the Anatolian hypotheses. So as I mentioned, that's the idea that when farming originated, um, in the Fertile Crescent, it subsequently spread to the Anatolian Peninsula and then into Europe and through Europe. And um, the last one of the last parts of Europe to uh, to be Neolithicized, if I can put it that way, to receive this Neolithic agricultural uh, way of life and technology and economy was uh, Britain and Ireland uh, round about. 4000 BC, 6000 years ago. Uh, one of the major um, debates about uh, the spread of agriculture has been, was that a migration or was that just a spread of the ideas? Did the ideas spread or did people spread? Uh, we know through genetics now that people definitely uh, spread out. There was this uh, migration of farmers and that's how farming got to Europe in the large part. Of course, they took ideas with them and there was elements of both, but people was a huge uh, component there. So that is a strength for the Anatolian hypothesis uh, as a linguistic theory, because um, when people uh, came in uh, sociolinguistically, there was definitely something going on. Should we um, view these farmers as Indo-European speakers though? That is the big question. Before I answer that question, um, I'll talk about uh, what that uh, model, the Anatolian hypothesis, would um, view as the uh, Celtic origins, and that would be the megalithic tradition. 
which um, these this is Neolithic uh, a Neolithic culture, uh, and it, these uh, megalithic stone monuments were built throughout Britain and Ireland, and France, particularly in Brittany, um, and in the Iberian Peninsula. So. Um, and the continu the, the the continuity through space, the similarities and design of these monuments over wide areas does suggest that they were in contact with each other and that they shared um, spiritual belief systems with each other. So you could well um, interpret uh, this as the archaeological manifestation of the Indo-European two Celtic uh, linguistic divergence. Just to let you know about the, the monuments that are pictured here, on the top right is Mays Howe, which is in Orkney, the Orkney Isles uh, in the north of Scotland. Underneath that, you've got Callanish, which is in the Isle of Lewis, in the, one of the western isles of Scotland. And um, the, the pictures on the uh, top left are taken on um, summer solstice in uh, one of the Irish passage tombs or chambered cairns um, uh, with the sun the sun aligning to the um, the passageway uh, on the summer solstice and interestingly uh, in the northern isles of Scotland it aligns in the winter solstice so as interesting as um, all of that is uh, in my in my view, uh, the people who built and used those monuments when they were constructed during the Neolithic uh, did not speak Celtic or any other Indo-European uh, language. So there's a, an issue uh, with linguistic paleontological paleo evidence. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what linguistic paleontology is. So uh, I mentioned earlier that you can create uh, dead languages, you can recreate them even if they existed before writing. For example, Proto-Indo-European uh, can be recreated from cognates between the uh, various Indo-European languages and especially the older Indo-European languages. So um, both in uh, reconstructed Proto-Germanic and Proto-Indo-European, both of these present uh, problems for the Anatolian hypothesis in the vocabulary that uh, these reconstructed proto-languages are uh, presenting us with. So firstly, I'll mention uh, the problems that pro reconstructed proto-Indo-European presents us with. Um, the main one is uh, presented in the picture here, and it relates to the terminology of uh, wagons and chariots. Um, because the, the, there's a gap of 3,500 years between um, when the Anatolian hypothesis believes that uh, these words would have been used and when uh, these nouns like wheels and chariots are actually found in the archaeological record. Secondly, Proto-Germanic, reconstructed Proto-Germanic is found to have a non-Indo-European, a pre-Indo-European substrate uh, and that substrate has a lot of vocabulary, which uh, is agricultural, which suggests that um, Indo-European speakers in the Germanic speaking area, or the area which would go on to be Germanic speaking, uh, learned agriculture from non-Indo-European speakers. So this is uh, evidence against the Anatolian model. The, now, there is um, evidence in support of the Anatolian hypothesis as well, which comes from computational historical linguistics. Uh, however, I don't accept that evidence. And if you read this book, or if you check out its author, uh, Asia Perlsvig, as well as Martin Lewis as well, but particularly Asia Perlsvig, if you check her on YouTube, there's some really great stuff. So I, I recommend that to you. And I should say as well, computational um, historical linguistics has also supported the competing step hypothesis, um, which uh, does uh, cast some doubt upon the methods that have been used. So I am uh, going to reject the Anatolian hypothesis for the spread of Indo-European to Europe. 
uh, which leads us on to the next hypothesis, which is the SEP hypothesis. Uh, so pictured in pink here is uh, the area which this model holds as the the area where Indo-European originated, and then it spread out widely, um, not with a spread of farming, but with a spread of nomadic pastoral uh, peoples who lived on the move, looking after their animals, uh, similar to the um, stereotypical um, uh, Im image of Native Americans and First Nations people uh, prior to uh, colonization by Europeans. And unlike the Anatone hypothesis, linguistic paleontology actually supports this uh, this this model. Um, the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European terms for animals and plants are all found in that area, uh, in the archaeological record as well, in the time scale which we would uh, hope for. There's the other piece of uh, linguistic support which I'll mention is uh, that. The steppe, the Pontic Caspian steppe, is situated between the Caucasus and the Urals. Um, and um, linguistically, Indo European is uh, most similar with the Uralic and Caucasian uh, language families. Now, there's debates about where they originated as well, but uh, as you might imagine by the names, the Urals and the Caucasus are uh, the two um, most popular theories. Now the spread uh, of uh, peoples from the Pontic Caspian steppe has long been theorised but it's also long been doubted so there's been a lot of sceptics and there still are but it has recently been confirmed through genetics and specifically through breakthrough in genetics uh, because we can now sample the autosome of the, ce of the cell and the gene um, and of the DNA rather than just the Y chromosome or the or the uh, mitochondrion, um, which would only tell you about two lineages, the sort of surname lineage, your father's 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 father, your mother's 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 mother. And if you look at this graph, you do see these two uh, lines on the side and you can see that um, there's a whole lot of information that you're not finding. So there's been a major breakthrough in the science and it's due to this breakthrough that uh, the, this, this uh, migration has been confirmed, which uh, was taken as major support for the step hypothesis. Now, I'm changing the topic a little bit here, um, but there is this question about if the Indo-European languages spread out, what happened to the, the Neolithic languages? And um, this this kind of took me on full circle in my research because I'm focusing on really ancient times that also brought me a little bit closer to home because the um, the textbook case study, the textbook example for the obsolescence of languages uh, really is uh, what happened to the American or East Sutherland uh, dialect of Gaelic. Um, and I recommend uh, the book pictured here as well as the uh, BBC Alaba documentary that you can find on YouTube uh, based on the work of Nancy Dorian, who's from Pennsylvania, who recorded that dialect. And uh, some of my ancestors were actually in uh, her ethnography. So it was it, it was really uh, quite a nice feeling like to go full circle like that uh, Indo-Europeanists from America even are citing that as a case study to understand what happened and the parallels. The parallels that I'm speaking about, uh, well, uh, these Marekin, which means fishers, um, well, they were victims of the Highland Clearances. Uh, they were pushed out, off of the hills where they had lived the, to the coast. Uh, they had to find a, a new way of living, learn this uh, dangerous trade uh, very quickly to survive or else they could emigrate or join the army where there are other options and uh, they were really uh, outcasts in society and when they got a chance after the first world war uh, most of them moved away and uh, found work in English speaking or Scots speaking settings and uh, the language or the dialect uh, of East Sutherland Gaelic really faded away and I would say only really exists inside textbooks today. 
when you see Dunrobin Castle in Sutherland, um, you can think about it almost as a parallel to some of the Bronze Age monuments that uh, the people who migrated from the Step were building. And uh, this huge statue on the top of um, Ben Braggy, which is visible from Golsby as well. It's all, you can also make similar similar comparison. And when you think about the plight that uh, these people went through, uh, it really does dissuade uh, dissuade you from uh, taking some sort of uh, right wing interpretation of uh, Celtic or Indo European, as some people do. The reason why I've got the Basque flag there is because um, I believe that the Neolithic languages were uh, related to Basque in some way. This model that I'm talking about, this parallels are that there's different uh, languages which are associated with different groups and different economies. Uh, Dorian called her book Language Death. Mallory said, couldn't we call it language suicide? Really, I think a lot of people in the area would uh, call it language murder. Um, and this is a parallel with what was going on in the in the Bronze Age when uh, the steppe, this nomadic pastoralists spread out from the steppe through Europe and elsewhere. Um, and by the way, uh, that coincided in part with a miniature ice age. So uh, growing plants as a farmer would have been really difficult and the attractiveness of being a nomadic pastoralist would have increased and that came with you know a language barrier to join that kind of uh, economy so that's what i think was going on the uh, migration from the steppe um reached britain and ireland um hand in hand with a material culture called the bell beaker uh, phenomenon and um Although that's not homogenous, uh, the Bell Beaker uh, culture originated in the Iberian Peninsula um, prior to the the spread that of uh, migration that far, which is really interesting for archaeologists uh, to tackle broad brushstrokes. And the, it also went hand in hand with the introduction of metallurgy to Britain and Ireland, also um, the Low Countries as well, uh, Netherlands, Belgium. Um, they they received uh, their earliest metallurgy at the same time. And um, if you consider the uh, what was going on with regards to the technology, this regard this demanded a lot of trading because um, the raw materials are so rare, copper and tin are very rare, uh, so there would be long distance trading and uh, it's fertile social linguistic grounds for language differentiation, in my opinion. Um, this could have uh, had an impact on the Indo-European language to uh, split off into something new. And also, um, the metallurgy in Britain and Ireland, it, it, as you see in the left hand uh, image, it took so long to spread out, metallurgy took so long to spread out, but when it got to Britain and Ireland, it rapidly developed. Uh, it, there's uh, something called uneven and combined development happened. There's futuristic anachronism um, because it uh, actually catch up, it caught up and then it overtook the preceding technology. Uh, because tin bronze alloying was mastered within centuries, which had had uh, only really been experimented with sporadically previously on the continent. And um, the, these uh, dynamics I'm talking about uh, were to some extent during the, the late third millennium BC um, confined to the Atlantic facade, Britain, Ireland, west of France, potentially uh, north of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, uh, and there were other, there were other networks in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, which were also uh, going on, but this area in the west of Europe was isolated from those, which again, it's social linguistic uh, fertile territory for viewing the historic differentiation of Celtic. Now, um, there is one scholar called James Mallory, uh, Professor Emeratus at Queen's University Belfast, who uh, has said that Celtic languages are too complex linguistically to be mere trading languages. Now, firstly, um, it's disputed that trading languages are uh, linguistically simple. And uh, a lot of linguists would say that defining uh, linguistic 
simplicity in um, organic languages is uh, almost impossible to do. But also, uh, th th these mobility networks were not limited to just trade. Um, it's, comp it's comparable to an industrial revolution. And um, even, even we can see from strontium isotope studies of human remains, uh, even young children were traveling on, vo on long voyages. And uh, potentially that was for fosterages and apprenticeships and so on. So I'm moving on in time now and I'm going to speak about the Iron Age, um, which is also applicable with the step hypothesis um, for Indo-European origins. Again, Mallory said in favour of an Iron Age model that uh, linguistic paleontology um, has uh, shown the words lead and iron in the proto-Celtic vocabulary um, and that uh, these metals show up in the archaeological record on the dates you see on, on screen um, and that Celtic cannot have emerged much earlier in those dates. That's really not an issue for me. I, I'm still comfortable to favour a Bronze Age origin. Um, despite that, it's only a few, a few centuries that, uh, difference that we're talking about. And it's uh, nowhere near the uh, 3,500 years um, incongruence uh, that that chariot scenario that I mentioned earlier with regards to the Anatolian hypothesis um, presented us with. But also, as I'm interested in uh, metallurgy, um, I'll mention that uh, the shift from bronze working as the predominant metal type to iron working had an impact on society and, and it had an introverting effect on society because unlike copper and tin, which are the components of bronze, uh, iron is really abundant geologically um, in the areas that we're talking about. You can see that these orange strips just underneath the peat, and um, that is iron, that's bog ore iron. When you exploit that, it'll grow back naturally in about 30 years, um, and it's found really widely. So the need to, the reliance upon long distance trading networks fell away, and it had a localizing impact upon society. So that's my rejection, actually, of the Iron Age model from an archaeometallurgical archeo perspective. Um, but having said that, there's, there's a, a variety of other reasons that people also reject the Iron Age model, which are uh, more popular than my own, but I'm keen to put my own contribution out there, as I've just done. So um, let's give it the benefit of the doubtful. If it did originate in the, if Celtic did originate in the Iron Age, um, what would be the archaeological manifestation of the of these uh, Celtic speakers? So there's a, a few options: uh, the hill forts, which are found uh, found widely uh, during the first millennium BC onwards. Um, widespread iron metallurgy has been uh, proposed. I don't accept that as I've outlined. Also, the spread of the what's called the Latin material culture and art style um, from Central Europe, which I've mentioned, which is not Celtic from the West. That's the traditional model. Also, uh, a spread of refugees from Roman Britain, potentially uh, not the origin, but certainly the spread. So I'm wrapping up now. Um, I believe that the archaeological manifestation of the earliest Celtic speakers uh, is in the early Bronze Age. And uh, if you um, want to know more about that, um, I'll recommend some books in a moment. I, I, I prefer the Celtic from the West interpretation rather than the uh, traditional Central European Hallstatt Latin model. Um, now we've got step hypothesis in yellow. I agree with I agree that the step hypothesis is best for understanding the spread of Indo-European languages, but perhaps not the origin. Indo-European may have originated elsewhere, for example, potentially in Armenia, before it got to the step. So there is some doubt in that respect, but I think it's half correct. So here's um, some foundational literature. And uh, I've put a link on screen where you can download my own works as well, uh, free of charge. 
and feel free to get in touch on there. There's an instant messaging function if you've got an account on that website. Uh, a little a little shout out as well, Mishnich Dalba, who um, are an activist group in Scotland for preserving the minority Gaelic language. They've got, as you can see here, a playlist um, for learning Gaelic, which takes you all the way from uh, A1 to B1. And that's nothing commercial. This is an activist group, as I say. I'd also recommend if you're interested in learning the Celtic languages, uh, find these guys on social media, the Association of uh, Celtic Students of Ireland and Britain. They do an annual, an annual conference, which has gone for eight years now. And uh, they're a really great bunch of people. And uh, they've got a podcast and everything. So that will be a, a real gateway to a whole abundance of resources if you're interested in learning these languages. Thanks very much. I'll be taking questions now. Are there any books, documentaries or other sources about linguistic paleontology that you'd recommend? So um, specifically with regards to Indo-European, there's, there's actually, uh, a, a, it's, it, one of the authors is James Mallory, who I mentioned. Uh, Co-author is Douglas Adam, I think. And they've offered uh, a, an encyclopedia of proto-Indo-European culture. So uh, there's a great variety, a great abundance of terms that have been um, uh, reconstructed to that um, that proto language, and um, it's quite overwhelming the length of this encyclopedia. But it, it also goes; it's not just about specifically that. Um, it's not specifically about that. It's not specifically about protein European. It also talks about their methodology and how they uh, use linguistic paleontology. Another um, a bit of literature that I'd recommend, uh, there's an author called uh, Gus Krunen, and um, he's done a couple of brilliant articles which um, are about Proto-Germanic. I mentioned, I mentioned uh, his case study that he found uh, um, non-Indo-European agricultural substrate in Proto-Germanic. Uh, so those are the, the sources that I've used to learn about linguistic paleontology. Thanks for the question, by the way, uh, Siru. So question two from Lily. Do you think that learning more about the history and origins of Celtic languages would encourage more people to learn them? Does it help you to understand the language? So I think that any positive attention which is paid to the minority Celtic languages is a good thing. And the more resources that there are and the more accessible it all becomes, the better, in my opinion. Um, I think that the priority has to be the here and now. I've talked about ancient history, but we need to think about the here and now if uh, we're going to do good things for the sociolinguistic situation. And uh, it's the here and now more than the history which attracts people to learning a language, I think. Uh, but learning about the history and the origins can definitely be a part of the animated vibrancy of an atmosphere which we would hope to create and uh, there's an unfortunate divide in academia between Celtic studies and archaeology as two very different disciplines uh, which I think is unnecessary but it does exist and um, archaeologists are mostly interested in prehistory but Celticists take an interest in time from the early medieval onwards because that's when there was writing and there was previously uh, quite there was previously uh, more overlap between these two disciplines, and Celtists took more of an interest in the Iron Age, but that's become unpopular now. And uh, I would say that history, the medieval and early modern history, rather than prehistory definitely does help in understanding aspects of the language, especially place names, which are all around us, and they're really, really interesting, but not many people understand them. How would we go about learning Proto-Indo-European? Now, that is a really good question. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating that people want to learn um, Proto-Indo-European. Sometimes with minority languages, people wrongly call them dead languages. 
and people don't understand the motivation to learn minority languages uh, like the Celtic languages, uh, the living Celtic languages that is. So for someone to learn a genuinely dead language is uh, truly an aspect uh, of dedication, um, which I admire. And um, obviously any kind of reconstruction of languages which existed before writing can't be accurate because of the amount of time that's passed. Um, and but there are enthusiasts who write literature and translate poetry into Proto-Indo-European. And uh, sources that I can suggest that you look up if you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, there's a project called Academia Priska. You can um, find their uh, website online, academiaprisha.org. And that's mostly the work of Fernando Lopez Menchero. And you'll find free ebooks to download as well as forums. And I'd also recommend the encyclopedias and the books that I mentioned by James Mallory and Douglas Adams. Okay, um, have we got any other questions? Question from Joanne. Could you give us an overview of the living Celtic languages and how widely they're used today? In blue, you've got, uh, blue, well, blue shows, apart from the Shetland Isles, blue shows all of Scotland, and that's to represent Scottish Gaelic. Green represents uh, Irish. Orange here represents Manx. And these three languages are sisters. These are the Gaelic languages, or the, the Goidelic languages, the Goidelic half of the living Celtic languages. Red is Welsh, yellow is Cornish, and black is Breton. And uh, these are the Bretonic languages. Um, I will say, uh, even putting in distinct categories between uh, Scottish Gaelic and uh, Irish, some people would say they're two dialects of the of the same language and the Irish which is spoken up here in uh, the north of Ireland in places like Donegal is closer with Scottish Gaelic than it is with the Gal the, the Irish from uh, the south of um, Ireland which is really interesting it's on a sort of continuum but there's issues with standardization as well which are potentially uh, pushing that away I would I would say and uh, in all of these places there are minority um, minority languages um so i think i think about one percent of scotland has said on the census that they understand some gaelic uh it'll be slightly higher in Ar in ireland because um they've got uh it's mandatory in the school system over there but to be honest uh most of the irish people they learn it in school because it's compulsory and then they don't use it ever again outside of school, which is really unfortunate. And in Scotland and in Ireland, these languages are mostly confined to the rural areas in the West Coast and in the islands on the West. Uh, having said that, though, it is growing in Glasgow. There's quite an active scene in Glasgow. You'll find events on every night. Um, also in Belfast as well. Uh, which is quite interesting for uh, reasons in society and politics. And um, so in Scotland, uh, there's some Gaelic medium primary schools, which have been about for around 20 years or so. There's a BBC radio station, a TV station. The highest density of uh, speakers of any living Celtic languages is in Wales. Uh, approximately 20% of uh, Welsh people, or people living in Wales rather, speak Welsh, which uh, is way higher than the amount of people in Scotland or Ireland or uh, any of the other areas um, that speak their Celtic language. So, yeah, Wales, the Welsh is uh, much healthier in that respect. But outside of uh, the areas uh, where these languages emerged. There's also a few communities around the world where these languages are spoken. For example, in Nova Scotia, 
uh, where many uh, Gaels emigrated to during the 1800s. And there's also a Welsh colony in Patagonia in Argentina, and they still speak Welsh to this day. And of course, uh, there's other people who all around the world learn online. And hopefully the tide turns for all Celtic languages. Remember, they weren't always minority languages. And although we do think of it as quite a, um, a continuous downfall, it has been more of an ebb and flow. Just to give you a bit of an idea about the places where these languages are spoken, Scotland and Wales have got devolution in the UK. The Isle of Man is a self-governing British Crown dependency and a sort of tax haven. Um, Ireland achieved independence from the UK uh, around 100 years ago. But the northeast of Ireland is still part of the UK, uh, which has devolution. And uh, the sociolinguistic uh, scenario in the north of Ireland is really different to the Republic of Ireland. Uh, I would say it's more working class in the north and it's much more of a political issue. Um, for example, the, the devolved government actually went on strike um because of disagreements about language and for that reason i thought it was interesting that a, a major esperanto event was going to be held there but it's also political at the grassroots level as well and a lot of um political prisoners learned irish in prison during the 70s and 80s um cornwall doesn't have any kind of autonomy within england and cornwall actually completely died away but it was revived which is really interesting uh, Brittany is similar to Cornwall because uh, it doesn't have any kind of uh, political autonomy within France. Okay, I am going to be moving on to the next question now. What do you think of the theory that there's a Afro-Semitic substrate to the Celtic languages? What do you think of the theory that there's an Afro-Semitic substrate to the Celtic languages? So thank you for the question. And I am very familiar with this theory. Um, however, uh, I am an archeologist and I'm not a linguist, so I can't really evaluate the theory. Uh, but I must say, I do not consider it some sort of fringe theory. I think that it is a serious scholarly contribution. Um, and I'm glad that, that you've asked the question. And, uh, so as I said, I can't really evaluate that theory because of my training. I am an archeologist, but what I can do as a prehistorian is that I can confirm that it is entirely plausible that Indo-European speakers in Europe were in contact with speakers of Afro-Asiatic speakers or Hamito-Semitic, it's also called. So that kind of influence uh, could well be real. For example, uh, examples of times when that influence was passed on. Uh, it could have been in the Neolithic with pre-Indo-European languages of Europe, which might have been Afro-Semitic, influencing the incoming Indo-European languages. It's also been proposed that there was a convergence of two connectivity spheres. So along the western fringe of Europe, with southern Portugal at the bottom and Scotland at the top. And I've spoken a little bit about this earlier, and that there was another uh, connectivity sphere from the Levant and the Middle East, Palestine in the east, all the way along the Mediterranean to southern Portugal at its western extreme. So southern Portugal and the uh, Gibraltar, this kind of area is where these two uh, hubs, these two networks meet. And um, you could um, suggest that both of these spheres were mainly connected with one of the two uh, language families that we're talking about and that there was influence in that way. Um, now, I'm going to mention Ireland as well um, because I've spoken about the Bell Beaker migration and um, linked it with uh, Indo-European. But as I mentioned, that wasn't a homogenous situation. And I've, learned, I've written about this a little bit. And um, so there's not much autosomal archaeological ancient DNA genetics results from Ireland that have been published yet. But that will change in the next few years. Uh, there's a lot from Britain. There's barely anything from Ireland. And uh, 
this kind of resonates with earlier theories about the Vell Beaker phenomenon, that there was two strands. There was a, a strand which is associated with this um, migration from the steppe and that it went to Britain and that it's similar with the Low Countries, Holland, Belgium and so on, and that there's another strand, Ireland being closer with Brittany and the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, that's really interesting to consider that um, that that more southerly and western uh, strand, including Ireland, uh, that these uh, that will be confirmed in the next few years. I think it's really exciting, and potentially that is uh, how this this potential influence came to be. So, um, as I say, uh, I don't know for sure. Um, but those are possible ways that this uh, this hypoth hypothetical um, substrate came into existence. And it would be cool to collaborate with a linguist who's interested in that theory. Thank you. I was just going to answer one last question and say that um, the Celtic languages um, were spoken much wider, not only in the in historically were spoken much wider, not only in uh, in Britain and Ireland uh, and and Brittany and France and the Arabian Peninsula, but also in other other areas where um, some people would argue that they weren't spoken at all, but others argue that they were in places like Turkey and even in the Bible there's a tribe called the Gal the the Galicians, which you can see is kind of similar to the Gales. And this really links back to um, the books by authors from uh, ancient Greece and Rome who mentioned Keltoi and Ke uh, Celts in their works. And people have taken that as a one to one analogy between the languages and the peoples who are mentioned in these uh, in these in this literature. But this is really uh, quite a contentious issue. But thank you very much for coming along and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the polyglot gathering and it's been a pleasure talking with you. So thanks again and um, I hope to uh, have my talk translated into Gaelic so hopefully you'll be able to join the subtitling project which I'll be uh, kicking off in the future for the polyglot gathering. If you do understand any of the Celtic languages, I'd love to have you involved in that particularly. Thank you very much again. All the best.